Hello, thank you to each of you for joining our webinar this morning. The aim of this webinar is to present an eco-efficient approach to sustainable and responsible refrigeration. My name is Delphine Martin, Global Marketing Manager at Climalife. First, I wanted to introduce our speakers of the day. Jean de Bernardi, EMEA Technical Leader at Honeywell. Good morning, Jean. Good morning, Delphine. How are you? I'm doing good, Delphine. Thank you. Pierre-Emmanuel Dané, Technical Support Manager at Climalife. Hello, Pierre-Emmanuel. Good morning, Delphine. Everything is okay? Everything is okay. Okay. And Jean-Yves Cléré, Field Engineering Support at ExxonMobil. Hi, Jean-Yves. Good morning, Delphine. Before passing the floor to our three experts, I would like to remind you the context. Our industry has focused to reduce the carbon footprint, a trend that has increased since 2015 with the implementation of F-gas regulation in Europe and more recently with the Kigali Amendment at an international level. This work is essential but to meet future needs, but it's not enough. As you can see on this slide, 80% of greenhouse gas emission in Europe were linked to the energy production and consumption sector in 2018. So energy efficiency is the challenge of today and tomorrow. But uh, what does eco-efficiency mean? First answer with Jean, who will present us a new model of eco-efficiency developed by Honeywell and validated by Semaphore, an independent organization. Yes, good morning, good morning, everybody. So the aim of this presentation on eco-efficiency is to first define it. And eco-efficiency for us is the, the way we have to define sustainability and how much does it, does it cost to reach this sustainability. You can see on, on the left chart uh, that most of the, the environmental regulations are based on GWP. And GWP captures roughly 35% of a leaking system and its impact on environment. It's not enough, obviously, if we want to, be, to, to catch sustainability. So there are two other possibilities, which are the TWE, Total Equivalent Warming Impact, and LCCP, which gets a bit more into account, but only 5% as a difference, and TWE is much easier to, to address. So we decided to, to focus on the environmental impact on TWE, and you can see that still all these numbers do not consider the financial impact to reach to that. So a coefficient is very simple, is defining TWE as a sustainability index for environmental impact and adding the financial impact, which is the total cost of ownership. And you can see on the chart on, on the right hand side that you will go from green to red and defining a financial benefit or penalty and an environmental benefit or penalty. I will share my presentation today into two sections. One is for the retail and the other one is for the industrial applications. So on the retail, I would just focus today on the 500 to 2000 square meter stores, which are the growing sectors in this activity. First of all, I don't want to bother too much on the details of the assumptions. There are a lot for sure. We consider the climatic areas, the loads, the setup, the condition, etc. Uh, and the most important is the capex and the opex, so the, the capital expenditure, the, the money you have to pay for purchasing and setting up the store, and the operate, operational expenditure, which is everything that costs to run the system. Uh, important to say, and Delphine mentioned it already, this model in these assumptions, and in particular the capex and the opex, was validated by Semaphore, uh, Semaphore being in Europe the best and the biggest certification body in refrigeration, expert in refrigeration, third party, most probably now in, in the world. So uh, very important to understand that this model is not the Honeywell uh, blah blah. I mean, this is really validated assumptions and validated outputs. Uh, the architectures we decided to model for this kind of sizes of stores are the following. Uh, first one is the baseline, traditional 404A direct expansion supermarkets, 
where we compared to booster CO2, traditional one for cold climates. Then we also implemented the one with multi-ejector and parallel compression for warm climates. Then we have this, what we call the semi-distributed system using, in this case, 448A, so still A1. And the, the philosophy of this architecture it is to split one large uh, refrigeration loop into several ones. So it's a kind of zoning of a supermarket where you could have eventually uh, several different uh, operating conditions. And this one is based on large condensing units, for instance. And the last one is the water loop, bottom left, which is quite fashionable now, with uh, 455A um, display cabinets condensing on a, on a glycol loop. So either uh, using a dry cooler for cold ambient or a chiller for warm ambient. The last comparison will be proposed on, on uh, because this is a solution that a store owner can choose, is to retrofit 404 to 448A. And in this case, we could compare to, to other architectures. Retrofit should be defined, okay, because there are several ways to do retrofit. Uh, the one we consider in this analysis is what we call the simple retrofit, lasting typically one night, where we would replace leaky valves, some pipe sections if needed, we change refrigerant, adjust settings, and that's it. I mean, this is just the simple action of retrofitting. So here is here are the, the first results. Uh, so this is for the proxy stores, huh, the, the, the local ones, 500 square meters. And you can see left or right, cold or warm ambience. The results are, are not exactly the same, but I would just comment on, on for instance, uh, warm ambient in Sevilla, where you can see in the middle, so the, the 404A base one, so 0% of financial advantage and 0% of environmental advantage. And if you consider the water loop, for instance, the blue dot running for 55A, you can see that this is a benefit in environmental impact because we have roughly 12 or 13% advantage. And it will cost on the total lifetime of the installation, including all costs, in the 10% additional to the traditional 404A. So it's a, it's a slightly higher cost for a slight benefit. If we go to the transcritical CO2 booster, the bottom purple dot, you will see an environmental advantage, which is better in the 25, roughly, percent. And the cost to achieve this one compared to a traditional 404 system will be in the plus 50 percent. So it would cost 50 percent bottom line to have this uh, environmental benefit. Compared to these ones, if you consider the semi-distributed options, so the one with multiple loops and condensing units, you would see that you are even saving slightly some money, actually, compared to 404 because you are getting into the financial advantage, the benefits. But to be honest, this is very similar to 404A, but here it is the best, actually, environmental beneficial because we are in a 35%, so much better than the other ones. And the last to compare in this kind of stores is the retrofit, and this is the top square, the red one, where you could see that the benefit is quite interesting in terms of environmental impact in a warm ambient. It's slightly different in the cold ambient on the left. But the cost, the cost benefit is really huge because in this one, if, if you look at the, on the top of my slide, the retrofit cost is only three to four percent of the capex of a new system. And that's the part why it's behaving so well in the efficiency scoring. So if you compare now for a given store for the same cooling service, so say you will be selling the same quantity of ice creams and, and yogurts, you would Pay, depending on if you choose a retrofit or a transcritical CO2 booster, you would pay roughly 100% difference in costs along the lifetime of the installation. The last point I want to make on this slide is the payback period, because depending on the climate, you will have different return on investment. In a warm climate, for instance, because this is the example I'm following now, this is basically three years, which means that considering the lifetime of a store that could be around 15 years. You could consider retrofitting, for instance, for stores which are uh, younger than 12 years old. So this defines the fleet that could be considered when looking at this kind of strategies. 
When we increase the size of the supermarket, the same analysis has been performed. So it makes sense that the results change. And here you can see the, so we, we can still stay on, on the warm ambient, for instance, on the, on the right, the impact, the environmental advantage increases, which is mainly linked to the fact that these formats uh, will consume much more electricity. And for instance, here you can see the transcritical CO2 as a 35% advantage when the semi-distributed is, is more in the 45, 46. And the cost is different now between all the architectures. Still semi-distributed is the same like for ray. And transcritical CO2 is more in, in the mind in a 20% negative penalty, financial penalty actually. And you will see that the comparison to the retrofit is still valid. It's not exactly the same figures, but still the same uh, ranking in the hierarchies. On the payback here, it's slightly different because of the large consumption of electricity, the payback would be faster. And here, in this case, retrofitting would give a payback within two years. So the, the fleet of stores to be considered is, is around all the ones younger than 13 years old. So this was the ranking, but now we could, because again, it has been validated by Semafroid, so we could consider now using this software, this approach, this model, uh, to put clarity on fears or uncertainties, because we, we had a lot of discussions with end users. And in this case, people were telling us, OK, but yes, if, if we consider this ranking, would it be still valid uh, if electricity tariff increases by 50 percent? What if the carbon tax pops up? What is prices of refrigerant increase? What is et cetera, et cetera? So we value a lot the sensitivity analysis using this tool because it's a kind of crystal ball where we could vary parameters and see how the ranking between the architectures will evolve. One example here, so this is not exactly the same setup like I shown before, but this is for the sake of this sensitivity analysis. In this case, these are 500 square meter stores downtown Paris. Some of you may know the, the brand and they are based on condensing units. So roughly three condensing units per store. And in this case, the, uh, the chain didn't want to consider transcritical CO2. So that's why it's not considered here. So only the retrofit option on the top gray square, you have the new built 448A condensing units, which are the orange triangle. And the same based on 455A, so our A2L with GWP below 150, which are the blue dot. And you can see that we vary the electricity tariff from left to right from the price we have today, typically in France, up to on the right, plus 50% in this modeling. I wanted to make a comment here that this is already the case. So this could be the evolution along the years, but this is as well the case today, depending on the geographical area of the store, because uh, this is the same repartition of costing we have between France and Belgium, for instance, where the cost of electricity today is, is in the range of plus 50%. So this approach could be in time or on the territory. And you can see that varying this electricity tariff moves a bit the position of the of the dots of the of the architectures but do not really drastically modify the ranking so values differs a bit but the decision made on the initial electricity tariff will be preserved even though the electricity tariff increases by 50 percent carbon tax for instance is, is a slight different story so still in the same kind of shops you can see the evolution from nothing on the left to 30 euro per ton of CO2. This is a model based on, on the French government project at a certain moment in time. We don't know where it goes, but this was just to see how it could impact on this kind of stores and the architecture's ranking. And you can see that this parameter, even though electricity tariff was not that impacting, this parameter impacts a lot. First of all, you can see all the dots going up, up to the financial advantage. And this is significantly saying that uh, there is a positive impact of this carbon tax to get rid of 404 because the more the carbon tax, the more benefits you get from uh, getting rid of very high expensive refrigerant in this case, because GWP is driving the, the cost of the carbon tax. But the second big conclusion is that if you go compare left to right, you will see that the new built, uh, so condensing unit based on 44, 8 or 455A 
are finally very similar in cost advantage compared to retrofit. So, so a higher carbon tax will most probably favor new builds. And in this case, obviously, the 455A shows the best environmental advantage. So this is a big conclusion. Uh, the, the last one I'm showing today is reliability. Very important is to be able to assess how much does it cost uh, when reliability is not always there. So I, I just wanted to highlight, because we, we heard a lot in 2019, 2020, issues with transcritical CO2 booster stopping sometimes in heat wave peaks. And we wanted to assess in the coefficient model how much does this cost when one day of operating income is lost. So on the small stores, the, the figures given to us by the profession is, is roughly 10k euro per day. And on, on larger stores, uh, this is more in, in the 30-ish. Okay. So in this analysis, we don't include the losses of food stuff because we don't have robust data. But in this case of just uh, operating income losses, we can see that one day of, of reliability issue costs 5% on the TCO, the total TCO of the installation on the full lifetime. This is really huge. So the cost of reliability is for us one of the most impacting driver in, in the choice of refrigerant architectures. Obviously, the complete the overall financial risk will depend on the number of accidents. Okay. And second, depending on where you are, if you are in a warm area, you might face longer accidents or you need to, to size the system properly to really meet the heat waves and the warm ambience because restarting at high pressure is a big issue. Just a fast one for those who believe it never happens. Uh, this is a summary. I won't go into the details. I will let you read through. But frigoris.fr, a, a French contractor site, made a survey of what happened in 2019 in France. And you could see that I mean, it really happened. And in some cases, it was, it was really dramatic. So the analysis we made is absolutely irrelevant and should be a part of the choice when you choose uh, the architectures. On the eco-efficiency, we have developed, because I just show you a few examples, we have developed a full calculator for retail where you could really tailor the eco-efficiency analysis on your own setup. So it can be really tailored to everything, including the type of cabinets. I mean, everything can be modified and it will automatically generate your ranking that you can see on, on the right. And as well, on the bottom, you can see that it will separate in, in kind of analytic mode for each CAPEX, OPEX, service, uh, CO2 footprint, etc. You can go down to the euros for each pole of spending. So it, it's a very interesting tool uh, that will be available in our distribution. So Climalife will have the access to this one to help you sort and eventually discuss on your needs and decide for new architectures for the, for the future. Now, the second part of my eco-efficiency application is an industrial case. So in this case, we had a different approach. We made a validation on measurements on site. We had the opportunity uh, a few months ago to make a back-to-back -back measurement comparing ammonia chillers to 1234Z chillers in uh, Apple storage, a uh, very large one, uh, 15,000 uh, tons of storage in the cold room. So what happens is that uh, in the machinery room where there was four ammonia chillers, uh, three of them were replaced by Z chillers. And these are comparable technologies, screw, inverter. I mean, th th this is really comparable. And we kept one ammonia chiller for comparison and measurement. And this measurement has been done by an, an expert third party, a consultant of Synergy, whose specialty is to measure uh, electricity consumption. And they compare the two chillers on the same load, uh, measuring all the electricity consumption and comparing the efficiencies of the two chillers. So what we did is that from there, we built the efficiency model, so which is now validated by third party measurements in this case. So on the left, what you can see is exactly the same comparison like I did for the retail. You have here as a reference, the baseline being the ammonia chiller in the middle, and the ZD chiller on, on is uh, the, the green squared uh, according to the measure made on site. So you can see that 
This uh, chiller uh, gives in the 25% environmental advantage and about the same in financial advantage. So this is really a massive, massive improvement in terms of environmental impact and uh, financial advantage. So this is what I meant when I said we define sustainability and we define the cost to reach it. I made my first trial on the right hand side. So, so sorry for that. This is the very first we did. But I wanted to show that what could be the next steps of this approach of eco-efficiency. We tried to figure out what is the insulation impact on the eco-efficiency, because insulation is obviously something to consider to increase uh, eco-efficiency score of any installation. So in this case, we considered Solsys LBA, which is our HFO-based foams uh, and panels. And we compared to a hydrocarbon base, which is very common, okay, so different lambda values. And you can see that this difference in lambda will generate on the lifetime of the installation a plus roughly 1.5% in both directions on the coefficiency. So based on that, you could calculate how much it would pay back uh, if you consider this one from day one in the new build systems to go for, for this kind of better insulation. Then you have values and you can really value it within the scope of this kind of, of studies. So my conclusions now, just to, to remind everybody. So in the retail, we have shown an objective comparative tool between refrigeration architectures, and this is a validated one by Semaphore. Okay. Important to see that total cost could vary a lot, and for the same refrigeration service, you can have differences up to 90%. So the question, why do you choose this kind of architecture? Now you have some possibility to answer. The sensitivity study is the most important because you can check the robustness of a technical choice when everything is fluctuating. So this is what I call the crystal ball. And what we saw as the most impacting parameter are really the energy efficiency for sure and reliability. Reliability is very big because it, it gives the most important uh, variation here. A coefficiency calculation is available for in the calculator very soon to tailor to any sort of configuration. In the industrial sector, the coefficiency model compares with a validated third-party measurement on site and gives 25% better TCO and environmental impact in favor of ZD. And you have seen 1.5% additional benefit could come from Solsys LBA, the insulation in the store panel, in the cold storage panel. That's it for me. Thanks, uh, Jean, for your interesting uh, presentation. So now we'll see with uh, Pierre-Emmanuel how we can also save energy and uh, reduce the impact of the environment by selecting the right heat transfer fluid. Yes, we will speak now about systems that use heat transfer fluid. Well, the first question is how to reconcile the economy and efficiency in an indirect system. So, is it possible to consider an indirect system if we are talking about energy efficiency? This may seem contradictory because we know that an indirect system consumes more than a direct system, that it is more expensive. Why is this? Quite simply, for design reasons. If we look at a direct system, to put it simply, it is a compressor, an evaporator, and a condenser. If we look at an indirect system, it is a compressor, an intermediate exchanger, a condenser, but also a pump to circulate the HTF in the distribution system. So you have more material and also bigger pipes with, of course, more insulation. More energy is needed to compensate for losses during the transfer to the intermediate exchanger and to power the electric motor of the pump. On average, for every additional degree to reach the same application's temperature as a direct system, there is an additional 2% consumption on average, which is not insignificant. Overall, this will represent an increase in consumption of 15 to 25%, and possibly as much as 30% compared to a direct system. To fully understand the principle, if application's temperature should be zero degrees Celsius, the evaporating temperature in direct expansions is minus five overall. With an indirect system for application at zero degrees, HTF medium at exchanger outlet is minus five, HTF medium at exchanger inlet is minus 10, so evaporating temperature is minus 15. 
two percent for each additional degrees here we have 10 cases of difference that can mean 20 percent more consumptions the gap is real and it is very important to be aware on this fact and of course this loss of capacity means we have to manage the choice, the choice of the HTF. The choice of the HTF is essential when the objective is efficiency. Several bases are, are available. The best HTF is water, but with its limits, freezing point at zero degree. There are saline solutions, which requires faultless control of the water tightness on the circuit, because if you have leaks, we, you will have some risk of corrosion in the short time. We have glycol solutions that have been used for decades, but based on a non-renewable resource. We have low pressure organic fluids, such as 1, 2, 3, 3 ZD, for example. And finally, the latest generation of HTF, plant-based are totally renewable resource. HTF, a plant origin, what is this? We have a plant from which we extract a raw material similar to sugar. After fermentation and refining, we obtain the compound we are interested in, 1.3 propane diol. Let's have a look now on the life cycle. The environmental balance sheet for the production of green one is very interesting compared to synthetic propane diol or propylene glycol. Indeed, from the cradle to the door, it is at the start of the installation, Greenhouse gas emissions during the production of 1.3 propanediol bio PDO are reduced by 40 or even 50% compared to the other base, such as propylene glycol. Energy consumption during production is also reduced by up to 50% compared to other bases. Of course, all these reductions are beneficial for our planet. From an application point of view, what are the characteristics of a green NaON? As you can see on the graph, it has a viscosity between that of MEG and MPG, but it is much lower than that of the MPG with a difference that increases as soon as the temperature goes below minus 15. For applications that require a non-toxic HTF, with green NaO, you can reach lower temperatures and go where you cannot with MPG which forms a crystalline slurry. Now, let's compare solution with an equivalent freezing point of minus 30 degrees Celsius. You can see on the graph that the difference in viscosity at 22 centistock compared to 38 at minus 10, and 43 compared to 78 at minus 20. This is between 42 or 45% in favor of green NaO. What are the benefits of a such large gap? The most important benefit is the impact on energy consumption that we have on the system. First case, let's compare the MPG and green NaO with a constant flow at the pump. For solution with freezing point at minus 13, the difference in consumption in favor of green NaO will be 3%. For solution with freezing point at minus 30, the gain will be 7%. It sounds good, and we could stop there. But let's go a little further. So, Pierre Manuel, if I understand well, we can save energy just by uh, changing uh, the MPG with uh, green Reneo. Uh, yes, Delphine, we can do even better if we make some adjustment on the installation. We can see on the next slide what type of adjustments are beneficial. So, let's keep the same concentration and act on the volume flow rate. A 2% reduction in the volume flow will double the energy saving. It goes from 3 to 8% for protection at minus 13, and from 7 to 12% for protection at minus 30. To conclude, with the choice of the lower viscosity HTF and good management of the distribution network, the initial handicap of the indirect system, which was 15 to 25% more energy consuming, can be reduced by about 10%. These elements make it perfectly legitimate in your choice of solutions. And you can see here some realization of Green Reneo. The first one in Spain is a soup manufacturer who simply tell us the result exceeded our expectations and those of production team. The characteristic of Green Reneo are true. We have seen that it is far better than any other glycol. Without any doubt, it is the best transfer fluid currently on the market. 
The second one in France is part of Danone Group, who manufacture baby food with a pack into jars, and they tell us. We choose Green One AO also for its performance as a heat transfer fluid. With the low viscosity of Greenway, the site opt for smaller KSB pumps, which offer significant energy saving. The fact that we have reduced pressure losses by almost 30% is impressive. Now, your role as advisor and professional in thermodynamic is essential for the future sustainability of our industry. Thank you, Pierre Emmanuel. So, we can have an eco-efficient approach by uh, choosing the right architecture, the good heat transfer fluid. What about lubricants? How can we also be more efficient? Thank you, Delphine. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for this opportunity to share mobile expertise in the field of refrigeration. The correct choice of lubricant can be a key contributor to the potential efficiency of the installation. Of course, the lubricant itself does not create energy. However, it can have a significant role to reduce any energy loss. Producing cold by using compression plays a major role in cold energy production. Refrigeration compressors require the use of lubricants. I will not today cover the general features of compressor oil. I will highlight the key lubricants one, which are having a major role in the efficiency of the refrigeration system. The main question is, where is the oil mostly contributing to this goal of energy efficiency? We know the answer in the compressors and in the evaporators. The main features of a refrigeration oil are, firstly, its resistance to motion, or more commonly called its viscosity. As uh, the lower the viscosity, the lower the primary energy required to put equipment in motion, as also demonstrated by Pierre Emmanuel with the viscosity of the heat transfer fluid. There is obviously a limit to which viscosity can be lowered, as the oil film can be broken, which then can lead to rapid and premature degradation of the compressor. Secondly, the traction coefficient. This is the way that molecules in the lubricant slide across each other under high shear and pressure, not to be confused with the friction coefficient between two pieces of metal in relative motion. And thirdly, the cold properties of the lubricant and especially the fluidity at very low temperatures can contribute significantly to improve the efficiency of the evaporators. ExxonMobil have developed advanced polyolesters and polyalpha-olefin-based molecules to lower traction coefficients compared to conventional polyolesters and mineral oils, as we can see on those graphs. For a given viscosity grade, the lower the traction coefficients, the lower the primary energy to be required to do the same work in a machine. We all know that having oil in evaporators leads to lower evaporator efficiency. In this white paper from Grasso, reporting the negative impact of oils in evaporators, and how equipment technologies and adjustments could fix some of the issues, we can see that the thickness of the oil layer, which sticks to the wall of the tube, is a function of the viscosity of the lubricant. It is reported that even at minus Celsius, which is generally the temperature target for some positive cold application, the impact of a contamination of the liquid ammonia with oil could lead to 25% heat transfer loss and to a cup reduction of more than 4%. In order to illustrate the impact of the cool properties of the lubricant at the evaporator levels, ExxonMobil has measured the viscosity of different mineral and synthetic oils available on the market over a range of low temperatures this is the, the data which are reported in the table. We can see that 
by applying the formula provided in the Grasso article that the oil film thickness can be reduced by more than 50% at minus 35 Celsius and up to 74% at 40 Celsius when comparing mineral and synthetic lubricant. So concretely, how can you save energy just by replacing a lubricant? Yes, we can, Delphine. Let's apply those physics and together look at what we can do and how ExxonMobil helps the end user to help save energy and enhance their refrigeration processes. This first example, Hatting, a Danish specialist in frozen bakeries, was using a mobile gargoyle Arctic 300, a mineral naphthenic oil, in the Harmonia installation. In order to assess the benefits of a switchover to mobile synthetic technology, a very comprehensive program was established between this customer, the Danish government, York, the refrigeration company, and mobile. Energy consumption, temperature, flow rate, and many other operating parameters on the compressors, the evaporators, and the wall installation were recorded and compared during a nine month control period. As a result of the switch to a mobile poly alpha olefin based ammonia refrigeration oil, those experts recorded lower temperatures in the compressor. 5% energy savings, equivalent to almost 52 megawatt hour on a an annual basis. However, the main process improvement was observed on the evaporators. Having a significant extra cooling capability, Hatting was able to increase its production without any additional refrigeration capex. We have Several other examples, we are still in the ammonia sector where negative temperatures to produce frozen goods are commonplace. This plant had been using a competitive mineral oil to lubricate the Howden screw compressor with no reported concerns for many years. We had been approached by this plant after they switched their production originally from Monday to Friday to 24-7. They were obliged to stop their production due to an important loss of efficiency in their evaporators. They also challenged us in asking not to overhaul their compressor in order to change seals while changing lubricant technology as they could not stop their process. We therefore recommended to drain the oil in service and refill with mobile Gargoyle Arctic SHC NH68 a blend of polyalpha olefin and alkyl benzene. As a result of this switch, the customer observed improvements of the efficiency in their evaporators, and they were able to resume 24-7 freezing operations. As illustrated in the table on the right, the viscosity at minus 35 Celsius of the mineral oil is about three times higher than the one of the recommended synthetic lubricant. Compared to mineral oil, the synthetic oil trapped in the evaporators was easily drained and recovered, significantly improving the heat transfer. This customer resumed his capability to produce 24 several thanks to the switchover to a more advanced mobile lubricant. This uh, CO2 ammonia cascade for this slaughterhouse is a, another excellent example of freezing evaporator efficiency, leading to added value benefit. Some years ago, ExxonMobil and its distributor replaced a competitive conventional polyolester oil used in the CO2 piston compressors by an advanced polyolester technology, Mobile SHC Gargoyle ATPOE. We later replaced the competitive mineral oil used in the Harmonia screw compressor by a mobile synthetic polyalpha olefin oil during overhauls of the Harmonia screw compressors. Having a two year baseline with competitive lubricant, the customer was able to progressively obtain the following benefits after two years with mobile lubricants. 
14, 14 percent energy efficiency increase and a significant increase of the availability of their freezing tunnels, which help them to debottleneck their freezing process without any additional investment nor changes on their installation. When we have analyzed those results, we found that uh, those achievements have been obtained due to a lower oil carryover to their evaporators and lower temperatures on their CO2 compressors. Those improvements were very impressive. And the increased efficiency on their CO2 evaporators also led to reduce ammonia requirements and therefore lower primary energy requirement for the same work. Indeed, it was a cascade. On top of the ability to double the production of frozen meat, this plant also annually enjoys a decrease of its electricity bill by a five digit number. Let's now look at what we can also propose for HFO and A2L. Let me showcase a, a process announcement that we obtained with HFO R1234ZD in a primary metal plant. The operating condition of the piston compressor were very challenging. 90 Celsius as ambient temperature at the top of the bridge crane with no oil cooler. This was leading to quick degradation of the compressors when running competitive polyolesters. The switchover to Mobile SHC Gargoyle ATPOE maintained the integrity of the compressor in such conditions. We know that HFO and HFO HFC blend are leading to new challenges for the lubricant point of view. Increased solubility of the HFO refrigerant in the oil when compared to HFC, leading to higher viscosity drop and therefore potential lubricity concerns with some conventional polyolesters. In order to address uh, those challenges, and on top of the existing advanced mobile polyolester technology already available, Mobile is currently introducing two new grades during the course of the first quarter next year. Mobile SHC Gargoyle 32 and Mobile EL Arctic 170. To support this introduction, we also developed viscosity pressure temperature charts for use with the newly available HFO and a 2 hell refrigerant, such as the one mentioned by, by Jean during his presentation for retrofit or new systems. So let's summarize. Lubricant types and technologies can have a major impact on the efficiency of the refrigeration system. Energy efficiency can be observed while maintaining a high protection against wear degradations of the equipment in service. And together with ClimaLife, ExxonMobil engineers are on hand to support your business. Thanks a lot for listening. Thanks a lot, uh, Jean-Yves. So interesting to see that lubricants also plays an important role. So now it's time to answer to your question. The first one that we received this morning, Jean, it's for you. If we want to try the new calculator, how we can process? Ah, okay, <clears throat> so uh, this calculator will be uh, available to our distribution uh, network uh, beginning of the year. So if you go to Clima Life, you will be able to find somebody there which you, who is trained and able to tailor a coefficiency model for the retail segment uh, for you. Absolutely no problem. Okay, so it will be available first for uh, retail, for supermarket, and in the second yes. part, uh, we can do it also for industry? Yes, yes, this is the steps we are following now, yes. But the, the first complete model will be on the retail and then the other module will follow. Okay, thank you, Jean. Another question for Jean-Yves. Can you tell us in practice, how do you manage a switch over from a competitive oil to an advanced mobile brand lubricants? Yeah, thank you, Delphine. Yeah, that's a good question. When we want to improve the efficiency of uh, the installation by just changing a lubricant, we need to do some preliminary work. And it is a common task for us. We shall first check if the competitive oil is compatible 
with the lubricant that we propose. And in the case of uh, refrigeration oils, it's mainly the case. Eh? But we have a lot of compatibility studies in our technical database. It has a, an impact on how we want to clean or to flush the system. It's also important to know the cleanliness conditions of the compressor. And also, does the compressor suffer of oil deposit? What does uh, the last use oil analysis of the competitive lubricant in service uh, tell us? So when we have all this information, we can either recommend a simple drain and refill at any time of the compressor life, or if we shall schedule the oil switch over during an overhaul of the compressor. It may require cleaning, it may require seal changes, and seals are very sensitive to the oil technology. But we have done uh, many uh, switchover of polyolesters and mineral oils, and we are always very close to our customer during those uh, operations. And as for any project, and the preparation work is the key for success. Thank you, uh, Jean-Yves. Another question, uh, it will be for Pierre-Emmanuel. Why should we choose an indirect system in the end? Okay, it's a good question. The chiller is more compact, that requires less space with a lower refrigerant charge. This is the first advantage. This solution combines also safety with smaller quantities of refrigerant. You can use toxic or not, flammable or not uh, type of refrigerant. You reduce the implementation contracts with simply, simply maintenance, leak detections, temperature control, easier and more efficient defrosting. And of course, uh, all of this combined with good governance uh, allows us to optimize uh, in order to be more efficient. For that, several levers are available. We have the possibility to operate during of peak hours to store at lower cost. You can uh, have uh, a good management of distribution networks. And of course, the last point and the most important is uh, to choose the right HDF for the application. This choice is the key uh, to success. Okay, thank you, Pierre Emmanuel. So, Climalife on Ewell and ExxonMobil, thank you to each of you. We will respond very quickly to any question not covered during this webinar if we receive it. If you want to contact us, do not hesitate. Climalife.uk at climalife.don.com. Thanks again, and I wish you a very nice day. Bye bye.